On the heels of a $765 million NFL settlement, dozens of former National Hockey League players are suing the league for negligence and fraud, saying not enough was done to protect them from concussions. Do these players have the basis for a credible class action suit, or are there still too many unknowns in this field to be able to win in court? Joining us now to help answer that in Irvine, California, Mel Owens. He's the attorney with NBO Law. He's representing the players in the class action lawsuit against the NHL. In our nation's capital, Doug Smith, former NHL player whose career was prematurely affected, let's say, by a traumatic brain injury. And with us in studio, Laith Gafoor, lawyer and managing director at Lucentum Sports and Entertainment. Doug Richards, medical director of the David L. McIntosh Sport Medicine Clinic at the U of T. He's also a former team physician for the Toronto Raptors basketball team. And Ken Campbell, co-author of Selling the Dream, How Hockey Parents and Their Kids Are Paying the Price for Our National Obsession. Okay, good to have everybody on the program. Thanks so much for joining us as well uh, in Points Beyond. We also want to hear from you, our audience, on this topic. Our producer, Sandra Jonas, and online producer, Elamin Abdelmahmoud, are hosting a Twitter chat right now, so chime in using the hashtag AgendaTVO. Mel, you filed the suit on behalf of uh, many National Hockey League players who are retired. Let's start by having you tell us why you did that. Well, obviously, you know that um, because of the collision sport, uh, a lot of players suffer uh, traumatic brain injuries. And as a result, uh, many of them are incapacitated or suffering long-term uh, problems because of the, the injuries suffered on the ice. And what kind of damages are you seeking from the NHL? Well, obviously everything that the court would award un under the law. Uh, can you put a dollar figure on it? Well, no, you, you really can't put a dollar figure on it because we don't know uh, what the damages are, are, would be at the end. and We don't know the financials right now of the NHL. Uh, once we can find out the, the uh, financials from the NHL, then we'll better be able to assess uh, damages. Well, we know they have $5.2 billion more dollars today than they did a week and a half ago, so presumably you're looking for a big figure? Well, what we're re really looking for is help for the players. Uh, as you know, a lot of players are, are abandoned after their playing days, and they're out on their own, and they have to seek relief uh, through their own pocketbook. Uh, so one of the major components is, you know, not only monitoring, but, you know, diagnostic testing, uh, rehab, and, and therapy. Uh, can you give us uh, some names of players who have put their names on the suit so far? Well, I could, but that's, what's, that's not important at, at this point. Anybody can go to my website and look uh, at the complaint, and the names are there. Okay, but I, I guess the reason I ask is a, a, a man whose name is well known in this province, Rick Vive, former captain of the Maple Leafs, was in and then was not in. So I thought it might just be helpful to our viewers to know who's in. Well, again, they can go to my website, melowens.com, and click on the link that has the whole complaint. And the, and the complaint at the beginning shows exactly who's in. Uh, at this point, and you know, obviously, there's more. There's more players that are in that are just not listed. Okay, what's happened since you filed the suit? Well, obviously, there's a lot of uh, inquiries and a lot of information coming out. There's a lot of information coming from, from both sides. Uh, we're inundated by by uh, uh, players who uh, who want to join the suit. Also, from family members uh, who who have either lost their their loved ones because of the game, uh, which they believe, or they're incapacitated. So there's a lot of information, and obviously this is uh, raising a lot of awareness uh, throughout the, the uh, uh, hockey community. And there was a, um, uh, an article in the, in the Denver Post where Scott Parker came out and is telling his story, and uh, where he suffered you know, between 20, 20 and 25 concussions. So there's a lot of information, a lot of stories, and in, in, in human interest stories that are coming out of this. Okay, let me put on the record for the moment the comments of the Deputy Commissioner of the NHL, Bill Daly, and then we'll go around the table in uh, literal and figurative to Ottawa as well and find out what you guys have to say about this. Uh, Bill Daly says, We are aware of the class action lawsuit filed today in the United States District Court for the District of Columbia on behalf of a group of former NHL players. While the subject matter is very serious, we are completely satisfied with the responsible manner in which the League and the Players Association have managed player safety over time, including with respect to head injuries and concussions. We intend to defend the case vigorously and have no further comment at this time. Ken, get us started. Do these players, in your view, have a case? Well, I mean, I've got uh, 
two lawyers here, so I'm not sure I'm as, as qualified to say but that. You know but the game. But, but I do know, yes, I, I like to think I know the game. And, and I mean, God bless the players for doing this. I'm, I'm not terribly confident that they're going to be successful. Um, obviously, a case like this is going to, it's going to turn on the evidence. And uh, I, I'm just not sure that the evidence is there that the NHL knew the dangers involved and, and, and knew that these players were going to suffer long-term damage and, and sent them out there. And, and not only that, and concealed it from the players. Um, and and I, I wonder about some of the, the, the players that are involved in this lawsuit. I mean, we've got players like Brad Aitken and Morris Titanic, uh, guys who played only a handful of games in the NHL. Um, how, how, do, how do you prove that their concussions were sustained while they were playing in the NHL? These guys played hundreds of games in the minor leagues. These guys played junior hockey. These guys played youth hockey. Mm. I, I mean, the, the, the concussions could have started or, or, or the complete problem could have been then. I, 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 I applaud the players for doing this. And, and if they can get some, get some traction on this and, and get some changes, I, I, I think it's a great thing. I'm, I'm just wondering if they're going to be uh, as successful as maybe they think they will. Okay. Doug Richards, your view? Well, I'm also not a lawyer, so I can't really comment on the merits I'm of the, the case. leaving the lawyers to the end. <laughs> so much as I can agree with Ken that I'm, I'm uh, happy that the players have brought this forward. I think that it's good that it will add fuel to the growing national discussion about health and safety in sport. Doug Smith, you sustained a uh, traumatic injury in a hockey game. Uh, might have affected your career going forward. Hard to imagine that it didn't affect your hockey career going forward. Uh, what's your view on what these players are trying to do? Well, my, my, I'm an author in this space. I wrote a, my latest book is called uh, The Trauma Code. And, you know, what it's about is, is, is how the brain, um, how we can speed up our brain and, 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 and how we can focus on recovery, minimizing risk and performance. Uh, I, 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 the studies that are coming out right now are conclusive. 100% of the players suffer from uh, brain injury every single year. Uh, and so I, we're never going to be able to prevent it. My position is that we will not be able to prevent this injury. So let's put an advocacy program in place. Uh, if, if the NHL chooses not to put an advocacy program in place, then they will be forced to put an advocacy program in place. I just, I, I agree with Mel. I, I think that, that we, uh, we have to put the players first. Doug, I need to follow up on one thing, and that is there's no question anybody who's ever played the NHL uh, certainly has been physically degraded as a result of playing the game. You can't help but play that game and be worse off physically after you're done playing. But you say 100% of the players sustain brain injuries. That's, that's a horse of a different color. Are you really comfortable saying that? Uh, absolutely, yeah, the studies are supporting it. Uh, you know, I speak at, at, a, at a university level uh, about this subject, uh, about the subject, uh, I, I'm looking at uh, axon constructs built in the laboratory at the University of Pennsylvania for implant. Built from stem cells, we can, we can rebuild the brain. We know what the sheer strength is of the axon now. Um, this is not about head-to-head -head contact. This is about playing a collision sport. It's about deceleration. So we have to stay on the issue and, and examine the issue. The, these players are suffering uh, these injuries. If you talk to any group of ex-NHL hockey players in the dressing room and you ask them how many concussions they have, they, they simply smile or laugh and uh, give you a very high number. Hmm. Okay, Laith? You are a lawyer. Everybody else has been saying, I'm not a lawyer, but you are a lawyer. Tell us what you think Mel Owens has to prove in this case in order to be successful. Well, one of the things that I think if you're looking at it, you want to draw parallels. And one of the things that uh, drives a lot of this, whether directly or indirectly, is that $765 million NFL settlement. One of the things that, that seems to have been clear in that case was that uh, there was strong evidence that the NFL had in its possession information, research, data that supported the fact that they discouraged their active players from seeking independent medical advice about whether they were prepared, ready, or able to get back on the field. So I, a lot of people look at the settlement and say that may have been the tipping point. I would say that if there is, and, and you know, for counsel, I would suspect they have a strong sentiment about this. If that information does exist, that the league had a policy, that discourage players from getting that independent advice, I think it really assists their case. One other element that I think that we should tie together on this point is the issue of Derek Bugard and the issue of... Just remind everybody who he so was. So Derek Bugard's case involved the wrongful death case that's in, in front of the courts right now. And one of the parallels in, in both cases is the element of whether or not there's a preemptive defense. And one of the things the NHL did 
will say this should not be in court. It is, it is a proper uh, forum should be through arbitration. So one of the things that I think will be important in the Bugard case is how successful they are in saying essentially issues of health and safety fall properly within the collective agreement. And if they're successful in that area, um, in the Bugard case and in this case, we're going to see whether or not that gets traction. So two points I think are important. Okay, just uh, again, we have a lot of people watch us here who are not sports fans, but who are interested in this topic. And so Derek Bugard was a, was he 6'7", Ken? 6'8"? I mean, he was an enormous hockey player. Yeah, he, he played around the league um, for not that long a period of time, as it turns out. Uh, he was an enforcer. His job was to beat people up, and, and in the end, he suffered how many concussions? I mean... Uh, well, he, he suffered a number of concussions, yeah. but one of the parts of this case... That, but we just explained how he died, I think, is what... I, we need to bring the background well, he in he here. Died, he died of a, of, a, of a drug overdose, but... Yeah, yeah. And, and part of, of, of the de Bugard case that doesn't really square with this one is, is that a major uh, part of that lawsuit is that uh, the medication that he received from the team doctors and, and the way his concussions were medically handled... Uh, that's that's an also a, a, a very big part of that case that I don't believe is is has anything to do with this case. Right. Okay. Uh, Mel, tell me this: the National Hockey, uh, the National Football League, excuse me, as we've already said, paid out a lot of money to players to make that claim go away. Uh, in making it go away, the NFL has not had to actually. I think I've got this right, don't they? They they did not have to admit any culpability in any of this, and as a result, they paid seven hundred sixty-five million dollars to about 18,000 former players to make this go away. How do you see that case influencing what you're attempting to do? Well, to answer your question, uh, obviously there's parallels. Um, but for anybody to think that uh, there's not enough information out there that the NHL should have known uh, is just ridiculous on its face. Uh, there's a number of players, and, we, and you just spoke of one of them uh, who died um, but the landscape uh, is full of NHL players who suffered these de debilitating injuries. And, and like someone mentioned earlier, like you started naming guys that pl played 20 or 30 or 40 games. Um, uh, I think Doug could attest, you, you don't need one game to take a massive hit uh, to, to uh, have these problems. And, you know, I, I played 10 years in the NFL. Uh, at linebacker, and while I'm not on ice, uh, I'm on the field, and hockey presents uh, significantly different problems. Uh, you, you have uh, uh, boards, you have glass, uh, you're going much faster, uh, the hits are coming from uh, different angles. Um, so to suggest that, that they didn't know or there's no connection is just laughable. Um, with the NFL uh, concussion lawsuit, um, they, they, they there's a proposed settlement. It hasn't been uh, um, okayed yet by, by, the, uh, by the players. Um, uh, there are parallels, but at the end of the day, um, you know, the players um, will be able to prove their case. Hmm. Uh, Doug Richards, the notion that Mel just said, that if the league doesn't actually have a smoking gun document in its hands saying, yes, we know the sport is injurious to your health even when played properly, but we don't care, they're unlikely to find that document. But the notion that they should have known anyway that these damages would happen. Is that a fair point? For me, uh, an important question there is when should they have known? Because our knowledge about concussions has evolved substantially over the last 50 years. So is this suit being filed by players who played 40 years ago? Because when they were playing, what we knew about concussions is very different from what we knew in 1990, which is very different from what we knew in 2000. Mm -hmm. We knew nothing so, back then, did we? Uh, we knew ago. very little. I mean, well, I know that if you get knocked out, yeah, I, I don't want to interrupt, but I, if you get knocked out um, and you're sent back in the game, um, you don't have to be a doctor to know that's dangerous. Mm -hmm. and, that, that, and if you're saying 50 years ago, it, it's, been, it's been happening. That, and, um, and they will have to take, take the oath and, and under penalty of perjury uh, and then in the discovery produce all the documents they have. And they should have known. This, this, this information has been uh, uh, out in the public since 1920 and ongoing. So yes, they, they should have known and they, in, in our position that they did know. Doug, finish your point. Well, there are different standards of scientific evidence involved. And I actually agree on a commonsensical level, Mel, that you know we've known about punch drunkenness in boxers for over 100 years. So it doesn't take a PhD in neurology to figure out that maybe the punches to the head caused some brain damage. Nonetheless, when I was in medical school in the 1970s, the neurosurgeons taught us and the textbook said that a concussion was a temporary neurological derangement with, quotes, no brain damage. 
Now, immediately after our professor said that, he said, I don't believe it. <laughs> that's what the textbook says, and that's what the syllabus says here in the curriculum that I'm lecturing on. But he didn't believe it because he had common sense, too. And nonetheless, to say scientifically that we know that a certain type of head acceleration causes permanent brain damage, we're still not there. I mean, uh, you know, Doug Smith said 100% of them are brain damaged. I actually believe that's the case, too. But I can't stand up in a scientific court and prove that yet. And Doug, let me get you to follow up on that, because with the National Football League case, they had significant amounts of data. They had uh, very sophisticated test results uh, over many, many years. Do you have that similar kind of information as it relates to players playing in the National Hockey League? Well, the, I'm involved in a study at, uh, at Boston University for uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Uh, there's a thousand players being studied right now. Um, the, the data that's coming out, which, which I won't share, I, I always follow up on it, but the most recent data is, is absolutely staggering. In, you know, if, if everybody could see it, they would, they would pull their kids out. Um, but again, m my position is this is a dangerous world, right? Brain injury happens to a lot of people for a lot of different reasons, uh, both, both emotionally and physically. Uh, but there are tools that we can introduce to, to, to help people minimize the risk, help them to recover, and help them to, to perform better. And the, the only reason the NHL hasn't put an advocacy program in place is very clear, because they would have opened themselves up to class action litigation a long time ago. Laith, is it fair to say that even if that smoking document I talked about a second ago doesn't exist, that the NHL, given the way the game is played, should have known that even if you play the game properly, as it's quote unquote meant to be played, you're taking your life in your hands in some respects? Well, I, I think one of the key things before you look at it is that both Mr. Daly and Mr. Batman are lawyers themselves by training. And so you have to think that as they made a number of strategic changes, whether in 97 with the, with the baseline testing, that they would have been aware of some of this discussion about liability and causation. One of the things I will say that the, the players will have as a challenge is causation. And I think that uh, was mentioned a bit earlier. You have players who have been playing from such a young age and, and being able to determine when exactly those injuries took place. And in some cases, in this particular class of the first 10 individuals, you have folks that played a very limited amount of games in, at the NHL level. But they probably played them on television, which means uh, there may be a lot of evidence out there for the most significant hits that they took, right? Well, it would be there, uh, and I agree that you, know, you, only, you only need one hit, and I've seen that to be able to have a devastating effect. But when you look at the cumulative effect of what athletics is and when it starts, and being able to pr prove causation and that the league had that information, I think that's a, what, that's a barrier. On top of that, though, one of the things the league has done, and this was an interview that uh, Bill Dilley had in the summer, they're aware of the culture of violence, and they've really made a deliberate effect of saying, we're not taking fighting out of the game. Because we think it's such an essential element of the entertainment value of hockey that we've kind of stake, made a stake there. And I think that may be some challenge um, that they're going to have because they really have made some, uh, they put their stake in the ground knowing yeah. that this climate was something that was foreseeable. See, to me, that's where the rubber hits the road on this. Fighting. It, not fighting, but uh, the culture of violence huh. in the game. Um, uh, Colin Campbell, who, who, who was at one point the, basically the czar of discipline in the NHL, I'll always remember the quote that he said. He said, we sell hate. And, and that's a damning indictment, I think. Did he think. say that to you? Oh, he said that to a, a, group of, a, a group of us. He said, we sell hate. And he was on the record as saying that. And how often do we hear about you, you know, the, the, uh, the, the deification of, of these guys who, um, who do nothing but fight or do nothing but maim their opponents. And, and, and another thing, too, is, is that, is that I, I, find it, I find it hilarious that you, you know, we have these enforcers in the game uh, because they're supposed to police the game and keep everybody honest. But most of the time, they're the ones who are causing the mayhem. So I mean, that's a bit of a side thing. But, but to me, I think that's where the rubbers really hits the road in this case, is the culture of violence that the NHL has sold for a, as long as it's been in business. And, and there's, there's many, many times when they could have taken fighting out of the game. There are many, many times when they could have reduced violence in the game. And they, they, didn't, they not only didn't do it, they refused to do it because they thought it was part of the entertainment package. And to me, if, there, if there's going to be a case here, that's where, that's where the case is going to be made. Hmm. Mel, aside from the monetary damage that you're looking for on behalf of your clients, is there anything else that you want out of the NHL? Well, like I stated earlier, uh, obviously there's the monitoring, the testing, the therapy, the rehab, 
uh, and any help it, that the players can get. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion, you know, up to this point about baseline testing. Well, that's a standalone proposition. Just because you did the baseline testing doesn't mean much unless there's follow-up on it or you're actually alerting the players. Uh, and up until recently, they had the trainers were the ones who let the players back in the game. And I think up until this point, they still don't have a, uh, a neurologist uh, on the bench. Um, and also, you know, you can be on the right side of this or you can be on the wrong side of this. Uh, the, the players know this. The families know this. So for the commissioner to say we don't have a, a link yet is just embarrassing. Uh, and again, at the end of the day, they're going to prove that, that the players were correct and the NHL was incorrect. Um, and the smoking gun, all you guys do is look at the baseline testing. Okay, but I guess what I was referring uh, to here is, the, it, is, is more rule changes or a ban on fighting. Are those things that you want to see emerge from this process as well? We're, we're not, we're, this is not about changing, you know, uh, the, the rules of the of the game. Uh, that will come from you know the players and the league themselves. We're talking about once you get injured, what happens? And they talk about the smoking gun. There's three things that are going hap to have to happen. You know, what did you know? When did you know it? And what did you tell the players? Because if you knew and didn't tell, we got problems. And to suggest that we still don't know whether these cause injuries. And again, to suggest that just because you played a handful of games in the league uh, is ridiculous. I never played hockey, at, but I played professional football. If I got on, on the ice, I know the speed of the game is so incredible, I'd want to leave after a couple seconds. And the hitting is so, is, is, is so profound that you don't have to play 20 games. It's like, how many, how many car accidents do you, do you have to have before you go to the hospital? Well, you're going to go one. Well, yeah, but you have how many one, times do you drive your car before you have an accident? I mean, I mean, are you well, suggesting that every player who's played one game in the NHL can make a case that he's had a brain injury? I, I mean, I find that rather preposterous take, myself. I, I, I don't quite understand. I mean, if a guy case. plays 300 games in the minors I will. and 20 games in the NHL, is there not more of a possibility that he had his brain injury, he sustained his brain injury playing the 300 games in the minors? I mean, have you watched the, the way the, the style of play in the minor leagues, in the AHL, okay, in the let's, international Let's let him answer, Ken. Go ahead, Mel. Yeah, and, and, that, and was that Ken who that was, was, that was who Ken. made a comment? Yeah, it was oh, me. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, of course. Of course. Of course there, there's hitting at all levels. But it's what the NHL knew and what they did and what he suffered on the ice as an NHL player. That's what's going on. Not some other uh, league uh, uh, up to this point. It's what happened in the NHL and what they knew when they knew it and what they tell the player. So yes, you, you, you can drive your car and not have an accident, and that's fine. But when you do have the accident, that's the problem. And what do you do about it? Let's just put a, a, a real life example on the table here. And I, I want to. Uh... Doug Smith, let me be the lawyer leading the witness here. I want to. I know you were on our program not too long ago talking about the, uh, the quite shocking incident that happened to you in a hockey game that that uh, well that you almost died from. Uh, can you briefly tell us about that moment where you went crashing into the boards and it all almost came to an end there for you? Yeah. Well, my injury happened in uh, in Austria. I went full speed head first into the end boards and shattered the fifth and sixth cervical vertebrae. I did suffer a, a brain injury at the time, but, but the broken bones were the, were the biggest issue. And, uh, you know, with respect to concussions and the multiple concussions, because that's the subject of the show, um, you know, if you were to talk to my wife or the, or the wife of, of any of the players, it's a lot easier to, for them to see the signs. You know, as someone who's a survivor, uh, and I'm sure Mel can attest, it's, it's close family members that are able to see the difference, uh, you know, in, in an individual. And, and to address the points that, that, that a couple of the other speakers were making, you can't compare um, the NHL as a business to minor hockey. Uh, you know, when you cross the lines into business, well, let, let's say that th this injury was happening to all the, the, uh, all the employees at Procter & Gamble. The government would shut them down if they didn't have a program to help them. You know, this is a business. Thank this is you. where people make money, you know. And so, you know, there's a difference between minor hockey and, 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 and being a professional out there. And, no, we get that done. And let having me do your, a follow-up with you here, though. Okay, let me do a follow-up yeah. with you, which is uh, after you sustained your injury, how long before you felt, quote-unquote, normal again? Well, I, I, 
That, 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 that's a, a, a really uh, tough question to answer. Um, you know, the, so in, injury is to the body as trauma is to the psyche. Right, the f recovering from a physical injury that we can see, that's easy. Mel knows how to do that. You're a professional athlete, you know how to do that. You know, a brain injury is a different world. You know, neurotrauma is a completely different space. Like I, I suf I've suffered many neurotraumas in my life, both to my uh, central nervous system and to my brain. And, and th these are things that, that you gotta work your way through. There, there's more than just a medical doctor taking your temperature or checking to see if the bone gets fixed. This isn't a six week process. This, is, this, this, is a, this process takes a lifetime. And, and, and if you don't work at it and you don't have the means to work at it, uh, and you don't use your brain and do the proper exercises and learn how this whole process works, you're in big trouble. Okay, Doug Richards, you've obviously had to work with lots of athletes over the years who've suffered these kinds of injuries. What's life like for them after repeated concussions? Well, it depends on the extent of the permanent damage. And uh, you know, as Doug Smith was alluding to, uh, recovery to a point where someone feels normal. In some cases, people feel normal, although we may still be able to measure defects in their performance if we use the right tools fairly shortly after an injury. But if people accumulate many such small injuries or sometimes all it takes is one big injury, they can have permanent effects. So that full recovery is uh, really not possible. I mean, you can, we talk about neuroplasticity, two types of the way the brain recovers. The pieces of the brain that are still working can pick up the slack and take over the function of parts of the brain that are damaged or there is a hope for actual structural recovery of some parts of the brain, although that's uh, more science fiction than science at this point in time. I think I read an article the other day, though, where Harry Carson, who used to be a linebacker with the New York Giants, had suffered so many concussions that well after his career was over, he was driving on the highway one day, and the pain in his head was just so bad, he said he wanted to just drive into the guardrail and kill himself because he couldn't take it anymore. Is that typical? I wouldn't call that typical, but we hear uh, in severe cases of, of things like that, or in, in severe cases, I mean, it, it, the problem gets worse over time. Because there's some tendency for the brain to work less well as we get old because of microvascular damage or many strokes or Alzheimer's or other degenerative diseases, the damage that may have occurred as a result of cumulative trauma combines with those synergistically to create a bigger problem. So as time goes on, it may be that the damage caused by the trauma has itself degraded, but other processes may have caused degradation, and the cumulative effect of that is cognitive impairment or emotional impairment, depression, even suicidal ideation, headaches, all kinds of things, somatic complaints. What's the worst thing you ever saw? Uh, well, I've seen severely demented uh, former athletes. And, uh, Any names you want to mention? No, I don't. That's confidential information. But, uh, you know, I, I must say, though, here we go, and the, the lawyers will have a field day with this. You see someone who's 65 years old who played, whether it was football or hockey, a, a rough sport, uh, and they've got brain damage. Um, they also perhaps drank heavily, and they also perhaps have high cholesterol and microvascular disease. And to what extent is the pathology in their brain, which we don't know the extent of it yet because they're not dead and you need to do an autopsy to really say how much brain damage there is, but with the best MRIs we've got and so on and we can identify some problems, how much of that was caused by the repetitive trauma of sport? I think it was a significant factor. I don't know that I can prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. And, but it wouldn't be 100% of the factors, what you're saying? No, correct. I think well, a reasonable person would apportion it and say the excessive alcohol consumption caused some of this and uh, vascular disease caused some of it and trauma caused okay. some of it. Okay, I hear Latham and then Mel wanting to get in as well. Well, to Go pick ahead. up on the point that was just made, from, a, from the perspective of this going to a jury, one of the things that uh, I think the NFL case had as a, an advantage was real life aging individuals, right, who had real life medical problems that, that individuals and communities could identify with, yeah. especially in the U.S. context. Big name players. Yeah, and, and you know, they had real bills. And I think that part of the challenge is twofold. The challenge they had individually was these are real life individuals who needed money or these settlements to, to defray the cost and move on with their lives. And so that really was a pressure on the class to, to make this settlement. But the second thing I think that will, that's in our situation is it's public opinion about whether or not we believe these young individuals, and the argument was raised, if you played one game versus two. So a lot of this, and if you're litigating a case and counsel will tell you, a lot of it you're pushing to get in front of a jury. And these are individual men and women who work in the community who have kids that play sports. And having that identifiable plaintiff, and you mentioned earlier about the enforcer class, 
and the age of, these are all pieces that go to the emotional piece. And that ultimately, as we're having a discussion in a public forum, you win that, that decision outside, where, where people form their opinions. And all you need to do is read message boards from you know, hockey fans throughout the country. And it really is polarizing. The people that love the game seem to think that this is just a money grab. The folks that live outside of the hockey world or the combative world can appreciate that there are some subtleties. And maybe perhaps why they don't watch the game is because of the violent nature of what's happened. Mel Owens, you wanted to follow up. Well. Let me address first that the, the statement when you see an older gentleman, or an older hockey player, or an older football player has the problems. If they've had a, if they you find him at 65, they probably had him at 35 when they left the game. You just didn't see him. And these things have these problems have been getting worse over time. It's just that when the informa information is shared, and they have common problems with the other players, do these do these uh, things come to light? I had a conversation with a player yesterday he was in the 60s and he goes he, th he said thank you because I always wondered what was going on with me and I had no idea that these uh, these problems were caused by you know the repetitive uh, 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 trauma to the head and you know the, the doctor spoke earlier that it's not one hit it's the repetitive nature and and again you go back to I played 20 games let's say in the NHL you could have a, you could have 100 hits in 20 games and and it's not only the head injuries it's the it's the spinal cord as well also, the, the players have what they term as a new normal. Um, they asked, you know, you asked uh, Doug if he has recovered. Well, you recover to a certain extent, but that becomes your new normal and how you feel on it every single day and you make accommodations for yourself. So it's, it's very, very important to understand that these problems um, have to be looked in the light of, of when they happened. And typically when they get uh, uh, fired from the NHL or the NFL, you're on your own. And people don't hear from these guys for a long time. And then when the problems come up, they go, oh, he was a drinker, or he, he, he was an alcoholic, or he, he had poor health. It's because of the trauma. Ken. Well, when you talk about age, I think it can also happen when you're 12. I mean, there, there's, uh, there's a place not far from these studios down the street. In fact, the uh, sports medicine specialist run by Dr. Michael Clarefield, who at one time was the um, team doctor, doctor for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Mm -hmm. And he told me for a book that I wrote that he sees probably 10 to 12 concussions a week in kids who are playing minor hockey. Um, kids of what ages? Anywhere from 10 to 18. I mean, I, there's, there's a, a story in, in my book about a young man by the name of Matthew Kostick who was forced out of hockey essentially at the age of 10. He was hit into the boards uh, with such force that he sustained, he sustained bruises on both sides of his brain. And uh, he's 15 or 16 years old now, and he still is having difficulty sleeping at night, concentrating. So see, that for me, that's where the causation factor becomes something a little murky. Okay, let me follow up on the player angle in this, though, and what, what responsibility the players bear in any of this, if any. And here's Roy McGregor, who knows a thing or two about hockey, plays it pretty well, plays it pretty tough. I played a charity game with Roy <laughs> once. He's a tough player. Uh, writing in the Globe and Mail earlier this year, he says the NHL has increasingly shown a reluctance even to use the word concussion. A player is described as dizzy or suffering whiplash. Anything to avoid using the word that is increasingly regarded as a stigma. It has become the game's C word. Uh, how much of this, uh, okay, Doug, uh, I guess Doug Smith, your best guy to go to on this first. How much of this is players who don't want to come out of games, who, thinks, who think it is uh, not macho enough of them to come out of games if they acknowledge that they've had quote unquote their bell rung, which is a you know sports term for concussion. How much of the responsibility in all this lies in that culture of macho? Yeah, real men uh, need to deal with their trauma is the answer to that. Um, men tend not to have the outlet that women have, and uh, they they hold it all inside, especially as an athlete. I mean, we're, we're all conditioned as athletes uh, to get to the top. We, what we're conditioned to do is knock people down, intimidate them, and take what they have. And, you know, we get paid a lot of money to do that, whether it's right or wrong. When we leave the game, we have to change the person that, that, that we became um, during that process. So, you, you know, I, 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 just, I just tend to, to work at it. Uh, and, and examine it, and, and uh, my, in my world, I'm trying to get people to become more aware, like you're doing today, 
and, and to get involved. Uh, we, we're, we're just at the very beginning, and, and I wanted to mention, uh, just to stray from the question a little bit, Steve, uh, Kurt David, who uh, is in Detroit, wrote a book called From Glory Days. And if you want to see the data, um, go, to, go to Kurt David's site uh, or fromglorydays.com and, and look at his work. He's got all the data associated with trauma in, in the four big sports. And, and it's almost 80% of, 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 of professional athletes are divorced, bankrupt, or in addiction counseling within, uh, within five years of their career ending. So, you know, we're just at the tip of the iceberg here when we're talking about the brain and how it functions and what we're conditioned to do and, and how it changes our behavior and, and, and how, you know, if there's no program in place after we leave or there's no program in place for the spouse or the kids or the player, everybody suffers. And there's, there's really no need for that. It's not a requirement. Steve, I think it has a lot less to do with machismo and I think it has a lot more to do with becoming the next Wally Pip. In okay, this case, there, there's a reference that, okay. that I get. Okay. <laughs> well, Wally, I think a Pip, lot of Wally won't. Pip was the baseball player who had a headache one day and didn't play, and then a fellow by the name of Lou Gehrig took his place in the Yankees lineup and never came out for 6,000 games or whatever it was that he Sorry, played. Sorry, 2,130. Okay, all okay. right. I thought you were a Boston Red Sox fan. Anyway, you know a lot That's about the Yankees. That's how I know about the Yankees because we hate them. All yeah. right, okay. But anyways, I think it has a, a lot more to do with, with that because the money is enormous now. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody wants to lose their spot in the lineup because if you're, particularly if you're a young player, you lose your spot in the lineup, there is a conga line of young players who are willing to take that spot and they may take that spot and run with it and you be, may be out of a career and you may never get a second contract or a third contract. Yeah. And I mean, we all know that the, the, the players that earn the big money in this game they are in the top 0.0001% of players. Yeah. The rest of the players Ken, are guys, who, 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 are guys who, pl who play the game and they end up out of the game and they sacrifice so much and they don't want to be the ones that do that. Okay. They want to be the ones that make the money. Doug wants in on this. Ken, it's, it's, it's not the mo about the money. It never was. It's about winning, right? It's about winning uh, and what you're, what you're trained to do. Um, you know, I had this discussion with Sean Rivers today and John Barrett in the dressing room. I, I, I went out for a skate with them today at Carleton University. And, uh, you know, we, we all agreed that, uh, you know, we, we wanted to win. We wanted to play. Um, but we were also not informed. And, 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 and you're going to get a lot of feedback from a lot of players uh, coming out with the truth on this. And it's going to line up. The stories are going to line up with the science. I can see it. I can see that the stories are going to line up with the science. I want to go there, to late. There, there's no other way. I can can I go. make a com Can I make a comment? Can go, I make a comment on that? Go ahead, Mel, and then I got a question for Leith after that. Sure. Right, thank you. Um, the, the question that was posed earlier was, you know, what what is the role of the players? Well, the players play, and the doctors have a duty for their care because the players typically are between 20 and 30, 35 years old. They're young guys. They don't have medical degrees. Um, or they don't, they're not trained uh, to know about the injuries. So m maybe they want to go back on the ice, but it's the, it's the duty of the doctor, who's, un who's the care they're under, is to uh, uh, stop the player from going back on the ice. Uh, and in many instances, they, th the culture is, you know, you got to go back and play. And, and Scott Parker's uh, article in the Denver Post, he, he said the coach was a bully. He says if you don't go back in there, because I guess he didn't want to fight one day or his foot uh, hurt so bad that he couldn't play, he goes, you'll go down to Hershey. That They'd love to have you and be smelling chocolate all day long. So the culture of it is that, and the players are the first ones to get demonized in this. Uh, there's so much pressure on them, and they, and, they, and they fault the players. It's not the players' fault. They're there to play. The, the doctors are there to take care of them. And if I'm a young guy and I trust the doctors and you clear me the play, I'm going back in. In the NFL, they take your helmet. In the NHL, they could take your helmet as well because you don't have to go back in or you can't play without your helmet. So that's what they do in the NFL. So the doctors clear these guys to go back to play or the trainers uh, up until 2011 were clearing guys to go back to play. And guys were sitting out one or two days and going back to play when they were completely knocked out and found themselves in the hospital. In a lot of instances, uh, they played the next day or played two days later. Hmm. So there's a lot of accountability for the NHL here. And, and, and they dem demonize the players, and they, and they say there's an assumption of the risk. There is not. The player goes back on the ice because he was cleared by the doctor. Let me follow up on trainer. that with you, Lath, on that, that assumption of risk yeah. argument. Because uh, some will say that, look, if you go on to a National Hockey League ice surface, 
playing a collision sport at a remarkable rate of speed with boards in some arenas with no gimme at all. You know, there are some, there are some glass, uh, what do you call that stuff? I mean, the, the plexiglass yeah. that has no give in it at all. And when you are crunched into it, that's it. You are, ta the argument goes, you are tacitly, by going onto that ice and playing that game, accepting a level of responsibility where pretty much anything can happen, and you know that, and therefore, que sera, sera. Right. Talk to us about that argument. It's a great point. Now, the two, the two juxtaposed or two legal principles that I think are in place are this assumption of risk argument, as well as what many lawyers will know is what's called a thin skull principle, meaning that you know all of us might look healthy, you look strong and healthy, I look like I'm capable, but we never know what's sort of bubbling underneath the surface what our predispositions are in terms of our head injuries in our heart. We've seen that with professional athletes who have died playing in the middle of a game, and that's happened. So I think those two positions are really important, but I think what's more important in terms of how this is couched, and I think that part of what the challenge in all of this is, this changing notion of when you talk about the players being responsible. Uh, I think anyone who's worked enough with athletes understand that they start very young, and the, the, the toughness that's a part of the culture of combative sports really makes it difficult to put that on the obligation of the player. The other thing that's also important is the changing dynamics of major, major broadcast contracts and collective bargaining that happens in the 70s and 80s and the, sal the salaries shooting up. So one of the dynamics in this class issue is the players that are in the 70s and 80s who didn't have the big paydays that people who are on the streets understand and it almost causes a visceral reaction, these overpaid athletes, right? Doing something that I would do in a heartbeat. Right. So you have that, and so you have a class of players that did not benefit these weren't the million dollar contract era of the sports. But I think what the argument comes in from the, from the perspective of counsel is saying the game was built on the backs of these individuals. The leagues benefited from these, 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 this era of players and therefore they didn't get the other end of the deal which is the money that goes with it. So I think that part of it plays into um, the optics of how the case is litigated outside of the court as I mentioned earlier. Doug Richards? On the that's notion a, of that's uh, a good the player's point. responsibility and um, the medical responsibility and there's a couple of points. First of all, as we said earlier, our, our knowledge has evolved quickly. In 1997, the American Academy of Neurology, no less, published a guideline that said if symptoms of a concussion had uh, abated by 15 minutes after the blow to the head, the player could go back the same day. Hmm. That was the standard of care. What year was that? 1997. Yikes. And if physicians obeyed the American Academy guideline in 1998 or 2000, uh, can we say that they didn't execute their duty of care? Now notice that that guideline says if symptoms have abated. Well, symptoms are manifestations of disorder reported by the person who got hit on the head. Concussion often has no objective signs. Sometimes it does temporarily, the knees buckle, the person's unconscious, but often the only manifestations of a concussion are that the person who was hit on the head feels dazed or confused or has a headache or some such thing. If the athlete denies any symptoms, and we ask them and we look them in the eyeball and say, do you have this? If they say no, 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 all the way down the list, who are we to say that they are lying to us? We don't have a lie detector strapped to them. Now, the guidelines have changed, and, and we don't let them go back and play the same day if they had any transient symptoms, even for milliseconds or microseconds. That's, that's one issue. There's one other point I want to make based on something that Mel said. And he suggested that as recently as 2011, uh, NHL teams were letting players who'd been knocked unconscious go back to play the next day. If that's the case, I am just struck with horror. Because you don't think it's the case? I, I don't, I'm not in the NHL, but if it is the case, I am dumbfounded okay. with I got, I got 30 seconds left. Mel, why don't you take that 30 seconds to respond to the, the thing that has apparently made Doug Richards uh, dumbstruck with horror, if it's in fact the case? Well, just read the news accounts. R read the, the players that have come out, uh, you know, not just recently, but over the past few years. Uh, they'll tell you um, uh, that they've been knocked out and they've come back a couple, couple days later. Uh, I read the article by Scott Parker in the Denver Post again, and he lays it all out that, you know, 20, 20 or 25 concussions, uh, they got punched in the head uh, over 4,000 times. I mean, you know, and once you, you don't have to be a doctor to know that these are ca causing, uh, you know, damage to the head. And again, it's repetitive head trauma. 
and the doctors are with the players all the time. The trainers are with the players all the time. So they know who the player is, how they act, and the symptoms. They, like like uh, I think Doug said, he goes, you know, oh, those are, those are headaches. You know, th that's, those are flu-like symptoms. So they were encouraging the guys to go back, even though they knew there was, there was hints and problems of, of ongoing lingering uh, effects of the repetitive head trauma. So, and again, once the doctors clear them, the player goes back on the ice or back on the field. So, you know, the doctors know what's going on. They're the trained professionals. The players are not. They're out there to play, the play and the doctors are the ones who have the standard of care and should know. I don't care what year it was, especially as you go through the 50s, the 60s, and 70s, and the 80s, and the 90s when that information was, uh, was compounding and profound. Mel Owens in California, Doug Smith in Ottawa, all of our guests here in Toronto. It's good of you all to join us tonight, participate in this discussion, and uh, we'll keep an eye on this story, to be sure, because it's not going anywhere. Thanks very much, everybody. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.